Last week, if you guys were here, we went through Colossians verses 1 through 14. Uh, we talked about how Paul, even though this is a typical Pauline greeting, he also begins his kind of opening argument. And we get this really eloquent description of God the Father. And then he kind of transitions here today in this text to deal with the Son. And that verses, like verses 13 and 14, could really go with either section or both sections. Um, I included them in last week's section, but they could really go to talk about, because they begin to talk about the sun. So it really kind of leads us into our discussion today. Um, and it's just important to remember, though, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we talked about the the Colossian church, right, and what they were going through as far as the heresies that were they were dealing with. And most of them no matter what the content of them were, had to deal somewhat with the deity of Christ or how they viewed Christ. Uh, John MacArthur says, a central component of the heresy that threatened the Colossian church was the denial of the deity of Christ. So today, we're going to go through a, Paul's, some people call it a Christ hymn, um, is really the kind of culmination of Paul's opening argument and serves as his foundation for the rest of the entire text of Colossians. So he's going to kind of circle back through this, not directly, but in, in so many words, through as you will walk through the book of Colossians. And, and Brian and I, as we teach, will kind of refer back to this probably pretty often. Um, and so in this section, we get reason, not just a reasoning for the, sup the supremacy, supremacy and preeminence of Christ, but we also get a brief glimpse as to why it's important and why it matters to the Colossians. And then consequently to us. So we'll start by, we'll read the whole text, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into the book. This is going to be rather flimsy today. We'll see how this works. So starting in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which was which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day again thank you for a chance to to study your word thank you for the the inspiration that you gave paul to write these words that they would benefit not only the colossian church but they would benefit all your church that hears them and then would continue our walk with you lord and continues to transform us to the likeness of your your son in your name we pray amen so you'll notice in your outlines as wide open as it is i broke the verses into three segments so you have verses 15 to 17, 18 to 20, and then 21 to 23. So if you want to title those, I'll give you the titles to those. Um, and we'll kind of explain them as we go. So the first section, the first three verses are Christ is supreme over the first creation. The second one would be Christ is supreme over his new creation. And then the last one is the, the effects and purpose of Christ's supremacy. And before we really get into these, I really want to just take a second to recognize the structure of like the hymnic poetic structure that Paul uses here. There are scholars that believe that Paul borrowed this him from somewhere in the early church um they think that maybe this is some adaptation and that paul knew what these words are because they don't sound like paul um but i would argue that 
in some ways they do sound like Paul. If we look at what he says, we studied Philippians, there's a little bit of a Christ hymn, um, which talks about the humiliation and the obedience of Christ. And so Paul does something very similar here. Um, and so too, even if Paul borrowed this, he adapted whatever hymn that was existent to his audience. But in either way, the, the real question of all that is, is whether he borrowed it, whether he adapted it, whether he came up this on his own with the inspiration of the Spirit, is does it really matter? What part are we talking about? The the entire Christ hymn if, in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, 23. Can you, can you say it one more time? Christ oh. is supreme. Uh, Christ is supreme over the first creation. Christ is supreme over his new creation. And then the final section is the effects and purpose of Christ's supremacy. And so, but again, so we have this idea that Paul maybe borrowed this hymn, maybe he didn't. But the question is, does it matter? Does it matter if Paul borrowed this? No. Why does it not matter? It's still God's word, right? So conversely, if Paul, Paul did borrow this from somewhere, does it make wherever this came from, if it were part of a bigger collection, would it make that whole thing God's word? No. Are you saying if you repeat yourself or if you got the idea from someplace else, how can you say it? When you're studying scripture, it's not inspired unless it's original. I mean, I don't understand why you're saying something is inspired and something might not be. So here's where I'm going with that. And I, we're not going to take a lot of time on this. Is So if this hymn is in scripture, it's inspired, right? And there are other pieces of scripture and there are other, and again, the internet is a fantastical place and it's a rabbit hole, right? But there are other allusions in the New Testament to works, books, collections that are not biblical, right? They're, so like we have the idea of like, I don't know if you've heard of like the book of Enoch or the Apocrypha. So the New Testament, there are kind of things, some things that line up. So the question is, if something from the Apocrypha found its way into scripture, right? Would all the Apocrypha then be scripture? No, no that's what I'm getting at, if that makes sense. <laughs> so whatever found its way into God's word is God's word. Right, even if it was borrowed from another source, but that doesn't make that whole source God's word. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm just thinking when Jesus quoted from the Old Testament, that gives more authority. That is mm -hmm. right. That, that's scripture. Yeah, that's Jesus. They quoted from the scriptures. Yes. Yes. But isn't the apocrypha? They don't know the source, and and that's why it's not in the Bible. Whereas the Bible, they they attest for the sources from God. So the Apocrypha, and I don't want to go down to, too far down this rabbit hole, but the Apocrypha, if you've read it or studied it, there are some things in the Apocrypha that contradict, contradict Scripture. So okay. way back in the early church when they came up with what they believed was the entire canon of Scripture, um, in accordance with the will of God, they believed that because these things contradicted and were not reconcilable, that they were not authentic Scripture. And they were not, they did, they believe they were not from God. And I would tend to agree. So we treat them as they are not scripture. They are helpful. They can be helpful. They, you just need to be careful and realize I would treat the Apocrypha like any of the other like religious books you would read today, if that makes sense, where they can be helpful. There's some things we can learn from them, but ultimately all these things need to sit under the authority of scripture, right? So if something in the Apocrypha contradicts scripture, scripture's right, the Apocrypha's wrong, uh -huh. right? In the same way that if I were reading a book by like, I'm reading a book by Costi Hinn right now about the gifts of the spirit. And there's some good stuff in there and a lot of it does line up with scripture, but if there's something that's against scripture, then Costi's wrong and scripture's right. And I need to, and you need to be able to see that. So, so, but the real question is, no, it doesn't matter. It's, this is the inspired word of God. This is what's in here. So Christ is supreme over the first creation. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. When we hear that phrase, the image of God, what comes to mind? It means something that's visible, right? Right. But, we, but the whole phrase, right? so image of God, what do we think of when we say image of God? What's the first thing that pops in your head? Hopefully, maybe not. Clearly not. 
His character. Who else was created in the image of God? Yeah. We were, right? So if Christ is the image of God and we're the image of God, how does that work together? This gets confusing. <laughs> right? But we know the verse, right? Genesis 1, 27. If you want to write it down, we don't. you don't have to turn there. Uh, so God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created them male and female. So if Adam was created in the image of God, would it be fair to say that Adam, in some way, bears the image of the divine pre-incarnate Christ? In some way. In some way. Yeah. Because if Christ is God, and man was created in God's image, then Adam has to bear some of that, right? Mm -hmm. Again, not the perfection, not the ultimate godhood, but he bears some of that. And so there's this weird... The commentators I read kind of go down this weird rabbit hole about the pre-incarnate Christ and how Christ is like the pre-Adam, and it gets really weird. But no, nevertheless, um, it's important to remember in these first three verses, when we talk about he's the image of the invisible God, we're not talking about the incarnate Christ yet. We're talking about his pre-incarnate state before he came to earth, before he, he was humiliated. He was in heaven. He was divine. He did not possess a human body. Right. And it's interesting because he'll we'll get to his incarnate state and you'll see the transition here between the first section, and the second section, we go from divine to incarnate. Sorry, lost my spot. So we see here too. Paul will get to his incarnate form, but really Paul wants to start from the beginning. From before the beginning, right? If you're going to talk about somebody who wants to explain Christ in his fullness, he needs to start from what he understands is the beginning. And that may not be, obviously, the full aspect of it, but Paul knows only so far. And so we also know, too, without destroying the meaning, the all of verse um, 15 is one sentence. So if he's the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation... Those two are inseparable. We can't really separate, though. So God the Son, as the image of the invisible God, is God. That's really the ultimate point here, is as the image of God, he is God. And not the same way that Adam, Adam was created in the image of God, because Adam was not considered the firstborn of all creation, because Adam didn't create anything. So, Maybe. yes? Is the word image different here than it is in Genesis? Maybe. Well, it definitely is because Genesis is in Hebrew, and <laughs> and and do I know if the Septuagint uses the same word? No, I do not. I did not look at that. There are some places I did look at that. This is not one of them. If I would, I would tend to think that it is. Um, the Greek word that's used here, image, is about like a reflection or a a kind of representation of. Um, but as, again, everything's bound by context, right? So if we pull this out of Scripture by itself, the, he's the image of God, then maybe we could say he's not God. But then Paul literally spends the next, you know, eight verses saying why he is God. So that's really what, the, really what he's getting at here. He's the firstborn of all creation. So obviously Christ was not born, at least not any in any way that we could ever understand. But scripture does say that he is the only begotten son of God, right? And I think, how many of you guys know the Nicene Creed? Well, I'm going to read it for you, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think it puts it rather nicely as to kind of describe how, as best we can understand, how the son emanates from the father. The Nicene Creed says, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, born of the father before all ages, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, and through him all things were made. So this idea of firstborn is although he was born, right? Not in the sense that we would be say we were born. He, uh, he is from the Father. He is, and the Father is all that he was from, right? So like if we're born, we have part of our mom, part of our dad. The son just has the Father. That's it. So he is, the word is consubstantial, is he's equal to, he is fully God. He is basically almost fully the Father, except he's his own entity, sort of, not really. He's his own person, but he's still God. 
this try this Trinity stuff gets confusing. Yes. And so we're gonna get we're gonna go down some rabbit holes here a little bit. But this idea of firstborn has less to do with like a timeline of being firstborn and more to do with primacy, right? Authority, Authority yeah. And so he says here, and I don't know what translation everyone's using, but the ESV uses all creation. Uh, some translations, I believe the King James, a couple others, use the word creatures. I don't think that's right. Because really his primacy is not just over the animated or the living creation, the creatures. It's over the animate and the inanimate. And so, and Paul will go on to, to describe this, but because he'll say all things, right? All things isn't just that which is living and breathing, but it's all things, right? His, his sovereignty and his supremacy isn't just over the living world or the visible world. It's over everything. And so again, this, this focus is just on, again, the pre-incarnate Christ who is the creator. And we'll see this in, in verse 17. He's the creator of all things. And just as Adam's temporal priority was not the main point of his purpose, but contributed to his ultimate design to be a world ruler, so these names, the firstborn and the one before all things, in Colossians, were not merely intended to indicate Christ's temporal priority to the old creation, but to primarily underscore his sovereignty over it. My outline's really weird. Okay. So, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. So all things were created by him. We said it already, all things, not just some. All things were created by him with the Father. And this kind of gives him equality with the Father. This is, he, Paul's already talked about the Father, and now we're kind of getting into the sense that Christ is, though he's the Son, he is equal to and is God and is divine. And again, this goes back to there's the idea that there's false teachings in Colossae and they're having to deal with their their understanding of the sovereignty of Christ is either wrong or incomplete or it's heretical. So visible and invisible. These are not necessarily references to the supernatural, um, though it might be implied. So Paul really, what Paul's going here for as far as like things seen and unseen, if we were to think of like the wind, right? You can't see the wind, but the wind is, I would not call the wind supernatural. It would still be a natural phenomenon. Because Paul is going to transition after to kind of talk about the invisible things in more depth. So you get a little, there's a little bit of supernatural essence there, I think, but not fully. Because he still wants to, to describe Christ as sovereign. He's trying to pick apart this idea that he is sovereign over all. And he wants to give a very vivid description of that. So it's not just, oh, he's sovereign over all. It's, it's all things, heaven, earth, visible, invisible. Right? He's kind of doubling down here for emphasis. Remember, it would have been an oral tradition too. So he's repeating these things in different words and building upon them to kind of, so they stick in people's minds. And he'll, he kind of reveals his purpose as to why at the end when he talks about living and being able to present them blameless and walking in the faith. So thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. So there's two thoughts here. One is he's talking about maybe like actual kingdoms and actual thrones in, in the living world. He could be talking about the Romans, um, the Greeks that have already collapsed at this point. Um, he could also be talking about and probably is talking about um, some sort of evil Right, this evil realm that exists, and in Colossians he uses similar language. Uh, Colossians two fifteen. If you want to write it down, uh, we can look at it later. Uh, Paul uses similar language to refer specifically evil as power and authorities. Right. So, and this is gets a little dicey, but because we know God did not create evil, God is not the author of evil. The author of sin is the furthest thing from Him. However, does that mean that it's not under, in some sense, His authority? I mean, you got. We know that the God is victor over Satan mm -hmm. in the end, so he's over that kind of story. He is. He didn't create. But in in the other sense too, like look, I, I love to go back to the story of Joseph, right? So all these bad things happened to Joseph. All these sins were committed against Joseph, 
But God was able to still, in his sovereign divine power, overcome all that sin and work things out to, according to his plan. So although he, in his will, has allowed sin and has allowed for the possibility of sin, um, he's still sovereign over it in the way that he's able to work around it to continue to work his purposes, if that makes sense. I think that goes back to um, free will. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if he had, if we did not have free will, then any obedience, any worship, any praise, any anything coming out of our mouth to glorify God mm -hmm. would be a sham because it, it's, it would be programmed into us. And so you can't have free will in allowing people to choose right or wrong and and yet not expect that there will be evil coming out of that. Mm -hmm. And that God knew that because he made a plan to redeem us even before the foundations of the world. So mm -hmm. he knew it already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and as Paul will go to describe when we talk about the the sovereignty over the the new creation that Christ has created, it's that's the that's where he's going. Is that he is the, he will he is and will be the victor over all these things. And though it sometimes it doesn't seem like it, he is. Um, there's another thought here too, and Paul's going to get there in chapter two. Um, one of the commentaries says the point is, and will become more evident in Colossians two verses four, eight, and ten that the hearers should not be deceived because Christ is the ruler over the invisible powers that are inspiring this wrong teaching through the false teachers. Mm -hmm. So even though people are trying to deceive them, ultimately Christ is still sovereign, right? And even though he's allowed this to happen, he's still in control. He is before all things. So this is basically kind of the same same sense he gives when we get he is the firstborn of all creation. That's probably repeated in a different way, again, for emphasis. Um, it also might be, when we get into the Greek a little bit here, that it depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> it is. Sorry. But that's what it is. So when it says he is the image of the invisible God, and then he is before all things, they're actually in different tenses. So the present tense could merely refer to Christ's existence, which is used in verse 17, 16 or 17. Or, or, or perhaps preferably, it indicates not only that Christ was sovereign over creation at its beginning, but also that he is in control of it throughout time until the end of history. As in verse 15, the Greek word for is, is probably timeless in the sense that it includes eternity past, present, and eternity future. The truth of Christ's sovereign existence occurs before, during, and after the creation and in the eternity future. And in him, all things hold together, which this probably furthers that idea of, right? He's not just the creator of all things. He didn't just create it and leave it alone. He is the sustainer of all things. There's a couple of translations here that use, I think, a different word, uh, but I think the, the ESV does pretty well here as far as he holds all things together, right? Christ is able to stay, sustain the old and first creation uh, that was created, obviously, in the garden. That idea, the earth, and everything that was created in it, he's been able to sustain up until this point and will sustain it until he creates a new heaven and a new earth, which is not the new creation we're going to talk about, but it's okay. So, Christ is supreme over the new creation. So, in this next three-verse section, we're going to see something where, from 18 to 20, Paul basically repeats what he says, but he's not talking about the old creation. He's going to be talking about the new creation. He says it in a little bit different wording, um, but it's the same kind of principle. Like, he's basically doubling down and repeating, but at the same time, he's building on Christ and building on his sovereignty. So, what... What do we think the new creation is? We talked about the old creation. We talked about Adam in the garden. We talked about the earth. So what do we think this idea of Christ is supreme over the new creation? What does that mean? What do we think? The church? Is it? Christian? New creation? Mm -hmm. Well, that'd be the church still. It'd still be the church, but I think it's 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 kind of a both-hand. So it'd be the church as a whole, but it's also the individual Christian, right? The new creation is 
is what does I believe Paul says it. I'm looking at Andrew because I feel like Andrew knows. Paul says it where Paul calls us a new creation in Christ, yeah. right? Yeah. First Corinthians, see? I can always count on him for, for that, <laughs> right? But Paul says that. Paul says we've become a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come, right? And so that's this idea here is that this is the new creation, if we want to call it that. Um, so we go from he is sovereign over the old creation. He's the head of the body, the church. So in his inaugur- obviously in his inauguration of the new creation, he is most certainly sovereign as the incarnate and glorified Christ. So here we get the idea as being the head of the body, the church, which he is the foundation of. He's the one who founded the church. So now we're talking about the incarnate Christ. He's the head of the body, the church. So what do, what sense do we get when we hear the word head or head of the body? What does what does that give us? We 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 have yeah. the ruler, yeah. authority. Right. But in what sense? Our example. I, I like I like doing this. This is fun. <laughs> He's our example. But like, what is the role of someone who is the head of the church? Keep things together. Keep it going in the right direction. Shop the authority. So he's the authority. But we, how often do we as sinful people view authority as such a negative thing? Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> right. We don't want to be bossed around. So it's important here to remember that we, especially because Paul doesn't just say he's the head of the church. He uses the reference, the head of the body, and then calls the body the church. That because he does it this way, he's not just talking about the head as a sense of authority over something because it's the head of the body, but also, and there's some implications from Ephesians 5 here when he talks about Christ in the church and husbands and wives. And it's not just that Christ rules over the church in some sort of authoritarian way, but that instead of being as being head of the body, he is also the reason for the church's growth and unity as the head. That's part of that role as the head. In the same way, if we talked about husbands and wives from Ephesians 5, right? Paul says, you know, the man is supposed to be head over the woman, but it's it's not supposed to, he's not supposed to lord that over her. He's supposed to grow with her. And but other people use that other ways. No, right? But he's supposed to help his wife grow and he's supposed to unify with his wife as a husband, not just lord over her as the ruler. In the same way Christ does with the church. And that's why people get mixed up with that. That's unfortunate. He is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. What does it mean that he's the firstborn from the dead? No. If, if we looked at te- like temporally and chronologically, he's not the first one who rose from the dead. But he's eternally yeah. the firstborn. From the dead is that he has eternal life. He is bodily risen. Mm-hmm. This is yes, eternally. If we looked at it that way, also I would say he's the most important person that rose from the dead, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If we looked at every person throughout human history, even up till today, if anybody's been risen from the dead, who is the author? Who is the the force behind that? Um, yeah. But if Christ is God, he's the only one who's been able to raise himself from the dead. Well, Father rose from the dead. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah, it is the same thing. Yeah. I've seen it. Right. right. It's, it's primacy. So it's not just first in order. It's first because he's the most important. Right? He is the most important one who has risen from the dead. He has that with him. Everything he might be preeminent. So that in everything he might be preeminent. So as weird as this might sound, if we look chronologically, and it's hard to to put God in a chronological box because he's eternal, even though he jumps in and out of time or is eternally in and out of time. That's a discussion for a whole day, at least. But there's this idea, though, that if, if he's the firstborn from the dead, before during the, again, it's it's convoluted a little bit here that his his raising from the dead has now given him full primacy over that too okay. where he was already primal he was probably sovereign over that anyway but this just gives him more sovereignty i don't know this i get a little bit confused on this one 
Other than it's very clear that he is preeminent over everything. Does it prove that thing? A little bit. It's probably that's probably a probably a good point, Lindy. It probably proves that. That he was sovereign over death, but now that he's raised from death, he's basically proven his sovereignty over it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like he had to prove to the disciples that he was sovereign over nature, and but they didn't seem to know that, so he had to calm the storm, and they still didn't get it, so then he had to walk on water, mm -hmm. and they probably still didn't get it. And then he caused the earthquake when he was on the cross, and people probably don't realize that either. So, so Christ's rule over the church is designed to demonstrate that he's supreme over the like this first from from first born from the dead is that he's supreme over now the first creation and the new creation all of it falls under his authority all the way through the consummation of history so verse 19 for in him all the fullness of god was pleased to dwell and this is the verse where we kind of realize that this is talking about the incarnate christ because especially when we look at um, like that verse in Philippians, we're talking about being one with God or being the image of God as as man. Um, there's this idea that the, obviously as man, he still had the fullness of God. And so we have that, that doctrine of, of incarnation where he still remains full deity with full humanity. And how that makes any sense is great, but it's about as confusing as the Trinity. <laughs> that's why we trust so but there are some old testament in implications here so psalm 68 16 to 17 um it kind of compares and paul might be doing this he might not be um it might be a stretch i'm not really sure i kind of like it though so we're gonna go there uh if you want to turn there you can psalm 68 verses 16 to 17 we're, only, we're going to read the whole thing, but we're only going to focus on a piece of it. It says, Why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord among them, Sinai, is now his sanctuary. So in Psalms, the, the psalmist paints this picture that the temple is the abode of God. And Paul is painting this picture that Christ is the abode of God. So really, he's starting to compare Christ as God's temple. And so, and Paul also calls who God's temple? We are. He says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And so if we're God's temple, or Christ is God's temple, who's, because Christ is sovereign over new creation, who's primal? Who's, who has primacy? Who is supreme? Christ. He's the perfect temple. Obviously, we are not the perfect temple. Not yet. So there's this association that Paul potentially again makes that God being God choosing to dwell in Christ, the man, right? Fully God, fully man is kind of the way God chose to dwell in his temple in the Old Testament. So God, it's one of the commentaries says God's tabernacling presence on earth has now become more fully expressed in Christ's incarnation that in the old architectural temple or that it was in the old architectural temple. And God was well pleased to do so. The spirit of Jesus continues that earthly presence in the church as the true form of the temple since Christ's ascension. And that's why there's no temple. There will be no temple in heaven because Jesus. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Temple. Building? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know that that's clear in scripture. Because if you read the when when this is how you interpret Revelation, we'll go down this rabbit hole for a second, okay, right? On Earth. But when there's a new heaven, and there is no yeah. So really, God is probably the temple, mm -hmm. right? But we get this picture of in Re Revelation 22, 23 of of the new heaven, new earth, and and Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, and the temple of God coming down. To earth, the question is, what does that mean? Is it a physical temple? Is it God himself? Is it just the people of God descending to earth to dwell in it? Oh. There are a hundred different explanations for that. Might be a physical temple, might not be. I don't know that it matters. Because <laughs> we get to be with God, so who cares? So, reconcile. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. 
So not only has Christ created all things, but he's able to reconcile all things to himself. But the question is begged here is, does Christ reconcile all things to himself? Yeah. He does? How does he do that, though? Sacrifice. So is everybody going to be saved then? If he reconciles all things to himself, is everybody going to be saved? No, because there's still free will, yeah. right? Christ, but then can he not? But then he can't reconcile all things to himself if not everybody's going to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm playing. You are playing, yes. yes. It's okay. So, but remember who we're talking about here. We're talking about the new creation. So in some sense, he can reconcile all of new creation, all those who have become the new creation to himself. Okay. Right? Yeah. And, then, and secondarily, he can reconcile all things to himself in a way that... Not all will be saved, but all things will be brought into their order. So those who are a new creation will be reconciled to him in a way that is, they're brought under his blood, they're saved, they're redeemed. But those who are outside of this new creation will still be reconciled to him through judgment. So it's kind of a both and, right? He can reconcile all things to himself in some way, but not in that salvation way, not, in, not through salvation. Could he save everybody? Yes, his blood is powerful enough to reconcile everybody. Will everybody be saved? No. No. Scripture is rather clear. The, one of the commentators says this does not indicate universal salvation, but that at the consummation, Christ will bring about harmony of all things in the new eternal creation after decisively judging evil and putting it in its judicial place. So, and then making peace through the blood of his cross. Again, there's two, there's two senses here, right? So the blood of his cross, we were, and Paul says it here, we were aliens, right? We were enemies with Christ, and his blood has made us at peace with Christ, at peace with God. Those who are not under the blood, after their judgment, even though they will be eternally judged, they will be in some sense at peace with God. And enemies. And it's that one's a little bit more hard. That's a little bit a little bit more of a stretch. Andrew, do you have a thought on that? On what? Sorry. What specifically? So how would an enemy of Christ be at peace with God? In some sense. Like if they've been judged. Well, that would be God looking at the judgment that was the last word, right? Which would be his, which would be God. God would be at peace. They might not yeah, be at peace, yeah. but God would be at peace. That's well, that would be my take. That's fair. Yeah. So his new creation, once an en enmity with God, but through the blood of Christ, those who were once enemies have been made friends and heirs. The new creation, and in the next verse, Paul uses, like I said, Paul uses the term alienation to describe the Colossians before they came to faith. So now in, in six verses, we have he is supreme over the original creation, he is supreme over his inaugurated new creation, which is his people, right, who are under his blood and under the salvation. And then now, why does any of this, the last three verses we get, why does any of this matter? <laughs> so that's why it's called the effects and purpose of Christ's cosmic supremacy. Um, in short, to reconcile them to God and make them acceptable in his presence. But we'll, we'll give that a little bit more. So at this point, Paul has given us his vivid argument that not only is Christ supreme over all things from the creation of the world, but also that he is sovereign over them and his people as the author of their salvation. So, and I get the sense, and Paul doesn't really say this, but I'm going to put this verse in here anyway, is Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, and mostly verse 2. Um, I'll read it for you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who is who for the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's it, right? He's the author and the perfecter. He's that's and that's what makes him sovereign, right? He didn't create just the whole world, he created our salvation. He's the author of our salvation, and that gives him preeminence over it.
So now in verse 21, he turns the tables and puts the Colossians directly and specifically under the authority of Christ. Because they have become, those who are the believers, part of this new creation, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And it's not really just to put the Colossians in their place, but rather to just further expand on this idea of the reconciliation of Christ. And he uses the Colossians because he's speaking to them as an example. Right? It's the, it's kind of that same thing if we go back to Romans, and I'm sure Andrew knows the reference. I'm going to pick on him all day since he's in here. Um, where he says, though, even when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? It's the same idea. You who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, doing what you wanted, right, have now been reconciled by his death and ordered, right? So he still died for them even when they were sinning. Even before they had heard the gospel, he had already died for them. Right? And it's not just, again, Paul kind of expands on a similar idea. They were doing evil deeds and they were hostile in mind. So it's not just that they were their actions were evil, but their thoughts were evil, their hearts were evil. They were evil through and through. Right? They were, as we call everyone, they were depraved. Right? They have that sinful kind of, um, what's the word? What's the word? Disposition that is with them from birth that only Christ can overcome. So why did he why did he reconcile them? Paul gives us the answer. Right? In order to so that to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So actually I skipped over something. I don't know. So uh, so it says and you who were once alienated and hostile, hostile in mind. Um, the Greek misses a misses a preposition there. It should probably be nevertheless or but, right? It should be so it'd be so it says after doing evil deeds, and then it goes to says he has now reconciled. There should be a but there, or a nevertheless. So even though you were doing all these things, nevertheless. In spite of their condition, of our condition, he still died for us, right? Through his death, he paid the price. So there's this, Paul gives a threefold answer as to why. To present them holy, blameless, and above reproach. And here, Paul gets a lot of Old Testament stuff mixed in here, right? First, the word holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. Yeah, set apart. So, and this the word Paul uses is the same word that is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In Leviticus, where sacrifices were considered holy before the Lord, or first holy to the Lord and then to the priests, right? He uses the same language, and that's the idea. This presentation of you as a sacrifice before God is, is acceptable because it's holy. The second word he uses is blameless which is also in the Septuagint, is used in Exodus and Deuteronomy, refers to spotless and unblemished animal sacrifices offered at the tabernacle. Right? And it's their unblemished and spotless nature that made them acceptable before God. And then and Paul's kind of playing on that in the same way, because in Romans, you know, we know he calls us sacrifices, and we are presented before God as living sacrifices, right? So it's the same idea, that because of his death, because we have been reconciled, we can be spotless, unblemished sacrifices, acceptable before God. And it's also interesting that some of these sacrifices that are referred to with this word, some were peace offerings and some were sin offerings that were meant to be blameless. And above reproach. Now, this one doesn't seem to fit in as much because there's not really an Old Testament metaphor for this one. Um, but in, in the same way, it's probably a double, he's doubling down, tripling down on the same kind of synonyms. So perhaps holy and blameless are better understood as one phrase, and above reproach, above reproach stands a little bit apart from that, though they all have the kind of that same sense. What does above reproach mean? Yes, yes. N.T. Wright, who I don't often agree with, says something really helpful here. 
He says, as often, Paul mixes metaphors, adding and adding the, the phrase above reproach, which would also be understood as free from accusation. <laughs> This indicates not merely a legal setting where a defendant might, like the woman in John 8, find himself without an accuser. The other New Testament uses of this word suggest the context of community life in general, where not even casual gossip will be able to find a word to say against the person in question. The NIV takes without blemish and free from accusation as explaining the meaning of holy, while the RSV sets all three terms in parallel, which is preferred. And I would agree that these three terms are set in parallel. They're all separate, but they all prove the same point, right? Because the whole holiness is more than the sum of blameless and above reproach. And because there's an and between all of them. And so when God looks at Christians, and Paul is saying this, he desires that they should be holy and without blemish and without reproach. They should be all three of these things, kind of separately and at the same time. So how can they do that? How can they stay holy and above reproach? Paul tells them. I love Paul's arguments. He says, if, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. So continuing in the faith to remain in Christ, to remain reconciled and not at en enmity with God. The question is, what does faith mean here? It's possible faith refers to the doctrinal content of what they believe, but it is more likely that it is the act of faith on the part of those who are listening or reading the word that they continue in the faith, right? They continue in acting through faith and having faith, not just that they believe in something. It's kind of a, again, a kind of a both and. Persevering in faith is thus the basis for benefiting from Christ as supreme over the new creation and as the end-time temple, which mediates reconciliation to sinful and alienated people. Paul likely has confidence that they will finally persevere in their salvific condition, or at least a majority will. So Paul's hopeful here that even though he's he's exhorting them to continue in the faith, he's hoping that they that he's certain that they most of them will probably continue the faith. But that's why he's writing this, because he wants them also to continue in the faith. If he didn't care about them and he didn't care about these false teachers, he wouldn't have written this letter. But he cared for God's people. And obviously God put it on his heart to write this letter because he inspired it. But if he, Paul himself didn't care for the Colossians or didn't care for what was going on there or care to combat false teachers, we wouldn't have any of his writings. That's That's the pastoral heart of Paul. So... There's also an issue here, and I'm going to tread very lightly. Um, this idea of continuing. Well, this is maybe where we disagree, so it's cool. He's standing up because we're going to debate now, actually. <laughs> so this idea of continuing in the faith. So there is a little bit of implications. I don't know if anybody's heard of the doctrine of eternal security or divine election and moral culpability. So, and there are two questions I'm going to ask you, just to get you thinking. You can answer them on your own, through your own studies, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to answer them for you, nor am I going to give you my answer, because I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's helpful. I don't, this is not, as Brian would say, this is not the gospel of Nate. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you need to reconcile that for yourselves. And that's, I think, the part of the purpose of this class is, is not just for me or Brian to stand up here and just teach you and vomit from the mouth all the stuff that we know, but to make you able to not just understand the words, but that you can study them on your own and you can come up with, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, your own beliefs that God leads you to. And yes, we, and especially in a non-denominational church, there are some secondary issues that we all have different little points of view on, right? We disagree on worship and spiritual gifts and and divine election and things like that. And that's fine, right? Because ultimately Christ is still supreme and the essential things are the essential things. And that we agree on. And that's what's most important. So it begs the question. So if they do not persevere, right? Because he says if, if they do persevere, this happens. So if they don't persevere, does it mean that they will lose the benefits of Christ's redemptive work that have been applied to them as the quote, elect of God, 
Or does it mean that they were pseudo believers all along and never really benefited from that work in the first place? Moving on. In either case, Paul uses steadfast and stable elsewhere, and it's used elsewhere in Greek writings as architectural terms to describe a building, to describe a, the stability of a structure, right? So they're stable and steadfast. They have a firm foundation, not even not in and of themselves, but on the reconciliation of Christ. Not wavering from the gospel that they had originally heard. It didn't say, the text doesn't say originally, but it's that's what he's talking about, the gospel that they had heard, which had been proclaimed to them in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So this goes right back to the beginning, right? Paul loves to do this. He loves to kind of come full circle. And then he'll, and really, the entire book of Colossians is this, because the rest of Colossians is going to tie back to this, mostly to this passage, right? Chapter one of Colossians is central to the entire book. So it ties back to Colossians 1, verses 4 to 7, where he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed to the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is the faithful minister on Christ, of Christ on your behalf. So really, Paul kind of finishes this segment of, of Colossians, and I would argue you could end chapter 1 right here. Again, chapter chapters, verses, section headings, none of these are inspired. So they make things easier to find, and that's great, but they sometimes end up in not so cool places it's like i really think the chapter should probably end right here if we're gonna end the chapter and the next one could start another brian might disagree with me and that's okay um but so really this concluding segment though paul is underscoring three things the importance of the gospel that the colossians had heard and in which they have put their hope the gospel's arrival among the colossians is just a small example of the gospel being spread throughout the world so how often do we think that we're special as Christians, like, because like we got it right. How many churches do you see say, Oh, we, we got it right. And everybody else has got it wrong. You see a lot of those churches, right? And this is this, I think maybe not so much, but to me, this is, that's dangerous. But to me, this is where Paul is saying, you know, the gospel has spread, but it's not just spread to you. It's spread to the whole world. You're special, but you're only as special as the, the gospel spreads to the whole world. So praise be to God that you heard it and you got saved. But at the same time, you can't just live in your little bubble, right? There's so many other things out there that are going on for you. And then finally, that Paul is, as he said in verse 1, he is the apostolic authority as, he, as God's chosen one, at least for this time period, behind the, the spread of the gospel, if that makes sense. So Paul is reiterating his apostolic authority. So he said, I, Paul, an apostle, and he says all this stuff, and he says all this stuff that I just said, this is what I'm, this is what I teach, this is whose, this is whose authority I have, right? Because everybody, we often find Paul, some, like, Paul wouldn't do this, but we, we kind of put Paul up on a pedestal, right? But I don't think, and I think I said this when I was teaching Philippians, I would never think Paul put himself on a pedestal. Like, Paul knew he was chosen. Paul knew he was an apostle. But at the same time, everything was Christ. Right? So even though I'm an apostle, I'm a minister, and I'm, not, I'm playing Paul at this, at this moment, right? I'm still under the supremacy of Christ. And that's what he, he's basically saying, is all this stuff I've just told you about the supremacy, the supremacy and authority of God and of Christ, right? I'm just a minister of it. I'm just a servant of it. So he uses the word minister in the first section too, right? Remember we talked about that last week is the word is servant. So I'm a servant of the one who is supreme. I'm not the supreme one. And so <clears throat> I'm sure Brian will have plenty to say next week because Brian and I both wrote a paper on this section. But Brian wrote his paper like... In, in my defense, Brian wrote his paper like a month ago. I wrote mine like two years ago. <laughs> and my, my opinions have vastly grown since then. 
So, but in this section, Paul paints a vivid and detailed word picture, the entire section, 15 to 23, of the supremacy and preeminence of Christ. The reason Paul is going to such great lengths seems to be twofold. On one hand, he's leaving little room for error in the minds of the, his Colossian readers and hearers, who were probably being vexed and tempted by Paul, false teachers. Paul was remarkably clear on the supreme power of Christ and his reconciling and redeeming nature. And while this is found a foundational doctrine, it is essential for newer believers to understand and believe. On the other hand, they're also viewed, this section is viewed as a hymnic praise to both the Father and the Son. Not only is Paul giving value in, valuable information to his readers, but he's also giving praise to God for all that he is and all that he has done. So, th and, and because of that, this passage really serves as a perfect foundation for anyone who is dealing with issues with the sovereignty and supremacy of God, the sovereignty and supremacy of Christ. It's also the perfect foundation for which the entire letter I guess, of Colossians rests. So, and I know we didn't spend a lot of time on the hymnic and the, the poetic nature of this passage, but really Paul is, in all things, when Paul gets like this, he does it, like I said, in Philippians 2, he gets like this for two purposes, right? One, he does want to praise God and, and give glory to God where glory is due. But at the same time, he still, as a pastor, wants to teach, right? And this is the beginnings of his teaching towards the Colossians. So there's there's twofold, two things that can be accomplished in this. So when he closes, he urges the Colossians to just stay the course, cling to the gospel, which is the opposite of what the Galatians had done. You guys have already gone through Galatians, right? Did has Brian gone through Galatians? Okay. So, but I'm just reminded of this, and we're going to close with this. Is uh, um, he talks about the power of the gospel and the importance of of the centricity of the gospel. I think if we take anything from this besides the supremacy of Christ is clinging to the gospel, right? And its authority and its efficiency. So Galatians 1, 6 through 10, he says, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is a one, another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to to one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you have received, let him be let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to still please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, in everything... That would be my plea of, of application today is just how do we, and I had some discussion questions here, but we were, we're out of time of just the importance of not only the authority and sufficiency of scripture, but like a discussion on how do we react to the sovereignty of God? Do we really submit to it? Are we really servants to it? Or we, do we fight him tooth and nail? Right? We're sinful. We love to fight him tooth and nail, but should we? So that's where this, this passage leads. And, um, with Brian's blessing, I'm going to shameless plug here a little bit. Um, so Andrew and I have started recording episodes for a podcast. Um, it's not out yet. It'll be out December 1st. It's called Fortitude in Truth. And the whole idea is to have discussions around like how everything is under the authority of scripture. Right. So we're going to start with thought. We, we're going to start our podcast with talking about like the aspects of scripture, it's it's authority, it's efficiency, it's inspiration. But then we're going to use that to build. And like we have as Christians, we have foundations in truth, right? Our fortitude, our strength should be in the truth with a capital T. So how do we live as Christians sufficient with that in a way that we, we live sufficient to the gospel, right? Because the gospel is sufficient for our lives and everything in finding a church and re in re really in understanding the Bible and in our relationships, in uh, you, you name it, it's sufficient for everything. It's it's very much so. So that's really the, the gist of that. So when it comes out, I'll probably pass along the links if you really want to give that a listen. Um, but it's just another avenue. Again, it's not, this isn't about me and Andrew. It's about, and he would say this too, uh, we don't like to talk about ourselves. 
we really want God to be the focal point and the gospel to be the focal point. And so if anybody gets anything out of this, praise be to God, because it's just two guys having a discussion about stuff we feel is important, but hopefully you got like people learn stuff. So that's it. Um, let's pray and we'll get you out of here. Father, we are so grateful for you today. We are just so in awe of your power in your work, in your creation, in your continued sustenation of this universe, Lord, that we can't fully comprehend how you can keep all these things working together. Lord, and in, in the midst of all that, that you would send your son to come down and to, to reconcile us to you, to pay the price for sin that we deserved, that we could be presented holy and blameless before you. Father, continue to just work your spirit in all of our hearts, that there might be less of us and more of you. Lord, that we continue to glorify you and become more like you. Father, we worship you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.